Welcome to the Jewelry Resellers Podcast, your go-to source for all things shiny, sparkly, and of course, profitable. I'm your host, Desiree, and I'll be your guide on this dazzling journey through the world of reselling jewelry. We'll be diving deep into the art and science of reselling, uncovering valuable tips, insider secrets, and sharing stories from successful jewelry resellers. We'll explore market trends, industry news, and even discuss how to find those hidden gems just waiting to be discovered in thrift stores, estate sales, and beyond. So if you're dreaming of turning your hobby into a hustle, or if you're a seasoned pro looking to stay at the top of your jewelry reselling game, join me each week for insights, stories, and more on the Jewelry Resellers Podcast. All right, welcome to another episode of the podcast. I am your jewelry reselling bestie, Desiree. And today we're going to talk about something I actually have been thinking a lot about. And I wanted to share my experience with you as it relates to selling jewelry in an antique mall. Now, I have gotten a couple of questions about this, especially when I first made the decision to sell my jewelry in an antique mall, and that was last year. And it's definitely been something that has taught me a lot. It has given me another unique perspective as it relates to being able to find people who want to buy the type of jewelry that I sell, that we sell, or that we plan to sell. All right, so that's what we're gonna cover in today's episode. And of course, I always like to remind you that if you enjoy this podcast and if you would like to keep in touch with me on a weekly basis, I invite you to join the weekly newsletter because I send that out every Friday and usually it has a recap of some of the episodes that went live that week. I also share jewelry news as it relates to selling jewelry, reselling jewelry, or sometimes just anything as it relates to (laughs) jewelry and the jewelry industry. Now, when you sign up for the newsletter, I will give you access to my personal list of the 20 best-selling vintage jewelry brands that I believe all resellers should know. So if all of that sounds good to you, all you need to do is head on over to the website and that is jewelryresellerspodcast.com. I will also have a link for you in the show notes. Okay, let's get back to today's topic. Now we are talking about selling jewelry in antique malls. Now, when I first thought about this, because I've been an antique mall shopper for years. I love antiques, vintage collectibles, all of that stuff. But of course, as I moved into being a jewelry reseller, I would actually source from antique malls from time to time. Now, not always because sometimes, you know, the pricing of the items just doesn't work, but sometimes you can find some really good deals. And it's a really great way to see all kinds of different jewelry. And so I guess it's kind of a educational opportunity for you as well. But When you think about it, selling jewelry in an antique mall can be very lucrative, especially if you have, especially if you have unique pieces, if you have stuff that's different, or maybe you just have things that are rare, super attractive. Maybe you have a lot of variety, whatever, you know, whatever the case may be. But antique malls attract a variety of shoppers and buyers who are looking for something unique either for their own personal collection or maybe for gifts or, you know, whatever the case may be. So I think antique malls definitely needs to be something that you consider when you are thinking about more ways to sell your jewelry. All right, but selling jewelry in an antique mall does have its own set of challenges, but its own set of good points as well. And that's what we're going to cover today. All right. Because when you think about antique mall selling, not just for jewelry, but anything, it's going to require a blend of good merchandising practices, 
You also have to get good at customer engagement, and we talk about that a lot on the podcast. And you also need to have a very deep understanding of your products and the market. All right, so you also want to learn how to set up your items in an attractive and engaging way. You want to get the pricing right because sometimes the antique mall will kind of set the tone for for what you can charge depending on what it is that you're selling. At least that's what I have learned. And so depending on the antique mall's customer buyer base, um, you'll have to figure that out. And it can be very unique depending on what antique mall you're at. And especially if you're new in an antique mall, like you still may not know exactly how everything works or how frequently you're going to make sales and all that stuff. All right. So let's get into some of my best tips and tricks to help you succeed in selling jewelry in antique malls. And I have a lot of points here. So some of these things are things that I have thought about. A lot of it is from my own experience. So you may have a different experience too. You know, if if you've sold in antique malls before, not just jewelry, but anything, you know that it's a very different kind of culture, different type of environment. And so those are all things that we have to think about if we plan on doing this or even if we are considering doing this. All right, so point number one that I have is it's very important for you to select the right antique mall for you. All right, because I know where I live, there's a bunch of antique malls in the area and some of them are more favorable for jewelry and then some of them are not. So you want to make sure that you visit the antique mall before you actually decide to, you know, commit to anything because the location and the type of antique mall is extremely important. You want to choose an antique mall that is well located and that has really good foot traffic. Because what I've learned too is that a lot of antique malls really don't advertise that heavily. I mean, they may throw an ad up here and there, but for the most part, it's not like they're running huge ads or commercials or or social media campaigns or anything like that. But you want to, if possible, you want to find antique malls that are near tourist attractions or in busy shopping areas because those tend to attract a lot more customers. You also want to learn what the demographics are for that particular antique mall. You know, ensure that the customer base aligns with the type of jewelry that you are selling or that you are planning to sell. You know, for example, higher end antique jewelry might sell better in an antique mall in an upscale neighborhood. Now, that's not always the case, but it's something to think about, right? It's something to think about. You also want to pay attention to the vendor's reputation. You know, you want to choose antique malls known for quality vendors. And sometimes this can be a little tricky because antique malls, you know, they're in the business to make money too. And sometimes they will just let anybody (laughs) sign up and sell anything. And that may or may not attract the right customers. So you want to look at who else is renting space in that antique mall. And are these vendors um, coinciding or at least kind of offering enough diversity as it relates to what they're selling to attract serious buyers? Because yes, that's what we're trying to do, right? We are trying to attract serious buyers so we can make the sales. We can make serious sales. (laughs) All right. The other thing I want you to think about is to really know and understand your market. This could take a little bit of research or it could just be asking questions uh, of maybe some of the employees of the antique mall that you're considering or having conversations with the other vendors. Now, that is what I did when I was looking around and trying to figure out what antique mall I wanted to sell my jewelry in. So I talked to some of the other vendors. Now they were not 
jewelry sellers, but they gave me a good pulse about what to expect as it relates to the type of shoppers that come in to that particular antique mall. So you wanna understand the types of customers that frequent that antique mall, like I said. Are they looking for higher end pieces? Are they looking for vintage bargains or maybe something unique and odd? Right? These are all things that you want to keep in mind when you are choosing the antique mall for you. We also wanna pay attention to the target audience. Now, this is something you can probably adjust as time goes on. You can tailor your items to appeal to a, a specific demographic that visits that mall. You know, high quality vintage jewelry pieces might appeal to more collectors and maybe the more affordable costume jewelry might attract casual buyers. And you can definitely offer different types of jewelry. So maybe you can attract both types of buyers as it relates to what you're selling. All right, number two, you wanna make sure you are clear and you understand the antique malls, policies and fees. All right, so if you are not familiar with how antique malls work or how they charge from what i have experienced the antique mall will charge you a fee for the space or for the glass case whatever it is that you are renting they will charge you a rental fee for the space they will also charge you a commission for when something sells and a lot of people get tripped up about this because they say, well, if I'm already paying for the space, why do I have to pay an additional uh, fee when something sells? Well, you have to understand too that the antique mall is handling the payment processing for you. The other thing is that you don't have to be there to make sales, right? The antique mall employees will package the item, ring up the item, collect payment, all on your behalf. So you don't have to be there, okay? So let's understand that there is a rental fee. Understand the cost of renting a booth or space in the antique mall. This can vary depending on the size and the location within the antique mall itself. So I know for the antique mall that I was at, you would pay more for spaces that are in the high traffic areas as it relates to the antique mall. And then if you had a space that was more towards the back or maybe not as heavily traveled <laughs> with uh, foot traffic, some of those spaces may be a little bit cheaper as it relates to the, the space fee or the space rental. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Now I talked about commission rates. Uh, now not all antique malls do this, but from from what I've learned, uh, more and more of them, if not all of them are doing it, at least in my area, they do take a commission, which is a percentage of your sales. And make sure you know and understand what these rates are uh, because they will affect your pricing strategy. And we will talk about that too. Now, most antique malls will require some type of a contract. Usually it's about six months others it's a year so you want to make sure you review the lease or the rental agreement you want to review that very carefully including any rules about staffing for your booth um, certain hours that you're allowed in to maybe restock or whatever because some antique malls have a what they like to call i guess a vendor's hour which is they open the antique mall about an hour before they open it to the public so that way vendors can come in and restock work their booth and whatever not all of them have that but a lot of them do and you also want to make sure you pay attention to what type of merchandise you can sell now you probably won't have any trouble with that as it relates to jewelry but i know in some antique malls they are very picky about you know things that are like weapons firearms that type of stuff so like I said, I don't think you have to worry about that with jewelry. Almost every antique mall I've ever been in <laughs> has jewelry. But if there are any type of restrictions, you do want to be aware of that so you don't you know, make a mistake or inadvertently put something out for sale that you shouldn't. Okay, 
So let's move on to my third point, and that is you want to make sure you prepare your jewelry for sale in the antique mall. Now, this doesn't mean you have to go overboard, right? You don't need to have uh, anything spectacular, although I have seen, <laughs> I have seen some amazing jewelry displays in antique malls. People really get into it. Sometimes they make all these little, uh, what do you call them? Like vignettes where it's, it's like a little setup and a little scene. I mean, you can do all of that and we'll talk about how to display your jewelry. But preparing your jewelry for sale, sometimes that could be a job in and of itself. All right, because we have to maybe clean the jewelry, polish it, whatever. You know, just ensure that all the jewelry is clean and that it is in perfect working order. Um, if there are any repairs that need to be made, make sure you do that before you put a piece out. Because presentation really is the key in making sales, especially for the high value antique rare jewelry items. All right, the other thing you're gonna to need to do to prepare your jewelry for sale is pricing. And whew, this, can be, this can be a very tedious process because you have to think about what you're going to price your jewelry pieces at. Then you have to make sure you tag everything because the antique malls are very picky about every item being tagged and you don't want someone to wanna to buy your, buy your necklace and then you don't have a tag on it or it falls off or whatever the case may be and so your item cannot be sold because the antique mall employee has no idea what you want to charge for that piece or whatever all right so make sure you tag your items properly and you can do this a variety of ways you can use those little hang tags that you can buy uh, I've done that. You can also use uh, index cards, you know, depending on how how big the piece is. Uh, I've used index cards and I've cut them down, you know, especially when you're selling sets or something like that and they come in like a jewelry box or whatever. You know, you can get really creative. Uh, some antique malls are very picky about the tagging of what, you know, how big it can be and what type of tag you can use. But I was really lucky in that my antique mall didn't care as long as the item was tagged and it clearly had your uh, dealer number or your vendor number on there. So they knew, you know, who, who, who the piece belonged to, you know, and it had the price and everything like that. Now you wanna price your items competitively, taking into account the mall's customer base like we talked about earlier, and what similar items are priced at in the same venue. And you wanna consider this because this happens more often than you think, but you wanna give yourself a little cushion or a little buffer to negotiate because surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, Haggling is very common in antique malls or in antique mall settings. People will, especially if you're working your booth and, and a buyer comes up and they, they see something and they want to buy it, they will ask you, oh, I see you're asking $100 for this. Would you consider taking 75 or 80 or whatever? Or would you consider uh, giving me a 20% discount if I buy more than one piece? You know, whatever, whatever <laughs> type of deal they're looking for. So you wanna make sure you price your items to kind of give you a little bit of negotiation room because like I said, people will ask. And a lot of times the antique mall, at least the one I was at, uh, they ask for your phone number. That way, if you're not there and a customer wants to negotiate, they will call you and say, hey, I've got a buyer in here. They wanna buy a lot of items. Would you consider giving them a discount because they're buying 10 pieces or whatever? And I'll say, yes, of course, I'll give them 20% off if they're buying 20, you know, 20 pieces or whatever the case may be. All right, so make sure you think about that as it relates to your pricing strategy. The other thing you want to make sure you have is an inventory list. Keep a detailed inventory list with descriptions, prices, and any, any information as it relates to your jewelry pieces. I can't tell you how important this is because sometimes you will sell something and or you'll sell a lot of some things and you will not, like the antique mall doesn't necessarily track everything for you. 
And so sometimes you'll, you won't know what's sold, right? Like you'll just, you'll just say, oh, wow, I sold 18 pieces this week. And then you won't like, honestly, you will not remember what everything was. So what I did is I, I have a notebook and I put down the SKU number because uh, everything had a SKU number. And then I also had a description of what the item was. So if it was a bracelet, if it was a necklace, earrings, whatever. And then I also um, would put the price that I was asking for and then the price it actually sold at. Okay, because like I said, sometimes you can negotiate discounts or whatever. And at my antique mall, uh, we were able to offer vendor discounts, not to the public, but to other vendors who wanted to shop. And that was also a nice thing because as a vendor, you could shop at a discount with other vendors. So I don't know if, if every antique mall does that, but the one I was in, they did that and it was really nice. Okay, so like I said, keep an inventory list, keep track of everything because this will help in managing your stock. And it also provides valuable information to you later on when you're trying to figure out what to restock with and what to uh, put in your booth or put in your case because then you'll have a good idea of what you know what is selling and what the buyers are looking for okay let's get into point number four and this is my favorite <laughs> probably my favorite part of selling in an antique mall and that is displaying your jewelry attractively Yes, like I said, you can have a lot of fun with this. I have seen some elaborate displays and I have also seen people just literally throwing their jewelry pieces on a shelf and <laughs> hoping for the best. But you want to make your jewelry very inviting. Like somebody has to get a really good idea of how this piece is going to look if 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 they're wearing it or maybe uh, if they're pre presenting it as a gift or maybe just having fun and showcasing the jewelry in a in a really unique and eye-catching way all right so when i sold my jewelry i rented a glass case because i knew that i did not want to risk anything getting stolen or anything getting lost or broken because people just are handling it, right? So, so depending on how you're selling your jewelry, if you're doing it in a glass case, glass case, you may be limited as it relates to how much space you have to display your jewelry. But if you're selling in a booth, then you probably could put a whole table up and then have some props or whatever, because I've seen that too. Right, so it just depends on how much space you're working with. All right, now lighting is really good too. It's something that you wanna think about. Of course, you don't have to have professional lights set up in your space, but I have seen people use those little, um, you know those lighted turntables? I've seen people use that to display their jewelry, especially if it's something really beautiful or really sparkly. Um, I've also seen people use lamps, you know, strategically placed lamps as it relates to their jewelry. And the lamp kind of gives a little bit more, uh, I guess, directed lighting to the jewelry pieces. Now, you don't have to do that, but, you know, I'm just throwing out some creative ideas that I've seen. Now, the other thing you also want to think about, too, is having different levels of display. Right, so you don't want everything just flat on the surface. If you can use risers, blocks, uh, stands, shelving, uh, anything, anything to make the jewelry visually appealing. All right, and this is fun for me because I like to, I just like to have my stuff look different. I don't want my, my space or my case to look like everyone else's so I really try to make it different and not only that but it helps people remember your space or remember your case because they say oh this is this is the one that has that really unique uh, mannequin <laughs> or whatever okay so uh, use vintage props and, and elegant stands and even um, theatrical setups you know depending on what you have access to and what you have space for
right? And you don't have to spend a lot of money on this. I found a lot of my props and stands at Goodwill, even things that you wouldn't even think could be used as a stand or anything. Like I, I used um, bowls, like really fun bowls that were colorful. I used a spice rack. Uh, what else have I used? I used little stands that I had found wherever. Um, so like I said, you just have fun with it and get really, really creative. Now, the other thing I'm going to throw out there too, is you want to make sure you organize your jewelry really well. Um, what I learned from my own experience is that organizing by color seems to draw in a lot of attention, uh, but that doesn't always work, you know, depending on what kind of jewelry you have, but you could sort it or display it and organize it by the type of jewelry. In other words, all necklaces. Um, you can also display it by era. You know, for example, you have all art deco or all rhinestone jewelry in one area or style. Uh, you can even display it in sets. Like maybe you have a necklace and some earrings and a bracelet that could go together. You know, maybe it's not an actual set from one designer, but maybe the colors or the style really looks good. And so you give your customers an idea of how they can style and wear these pieces either together, together or separately. All right. So think about that. And like I said, this is the most fun part of selling in an antique mall for me because you get to really be creative and have fun. Now, I mentioned this earlier, you want to offer a variety of items as it relates to your jewelry and not only the type, but also different price points because people will come in and they'll say, oh, I have, you know, $20 to spend. What can you, you know, what do you have or what can you show me that is $20 or less? People will ask you that. All right. And you can even put little signs here, you know, uh, $10 bracelets or, um, you know, $20 and under jewelry pieces, you know, because people love to get a deal and they love to really find something that fits within their budget. OK, so so do something like that and offer that, because like I said, you will have people come in there asking for a specific <laughs> a specific price point as it relates to jewelry. All right, you also want to have unique pieces. I've mentioned that too. You know, some standout pieces that really can draw people in. And, and I, I like to call these those uh, showstopper pieces. Even though not everybody is looking for that, the fact that it will just draw attention to your space, to your booth or to your case, whatever, um, people love to see stuff like that. Something unique that they just don't see every day. All right, let's move on to point number five, and that is pricing. Now, again, this could be a little challenging depending on exactly what you're selling and the type of buyer that you are catering to, but you always wanna be competitive in your pricing and don't be afraid to run sales from time to time. Now, I know at my antique mall, they actually encourage you to run a sale every week. You know, it could be 10% 10, 10 off, uh, buy one, get one free, uh, any type of something to really make people stop and look at your items, all right? So you wanna price your items competitively. You wanna research what similar items are selling for in the same mall and online. And you want to make sure that you have clear pricing so you avoid any confusion. Make sure that people can read your tags uh, if you are writing them out by hand. And sometimes you can have really uh, unique tags. Like they don't just have to be white tags. I've seen people use really creative stickers or colorful tags that maybe they had printed or whatever. Uh, you don't have to do that, but again, anything to get more attention and more eyes on your products or on your items is a good idea. All right, point number six, and this is where I think a lot of people get intimidated, and that's learning how to market your presence in the antique mall. Now, marketing for an antique mall is very different than marketing your 
business, your jewelry reselling business online. So there's two ways you can do this. You can market your presence within the store, within the space. Some antique malls allow you to pay a little extra to be mentioned in maybe the ads that they run. You also want to think about creative signage as it relates to your booth or your space. Now, my antique mall, they didn't have a problem with that. You could have whatever kind of sign you wanted on your space or in your booth. It could be printed. It could be handwritten. They didn't care <laughs> as long as you, you know, kept it to within the confines of your particular space. You know, obviously they didn't want you putting signs in your neighbor's booth or anything like that. Um, but really making attractive signs, again, to have people notice your items. And you could do this however you want, right? Well, again, depending on the rules of the antique mall, but you wanna have some attractive signage that includes your business name, maybe a brief tagline about your offerings. You know, for example, you could say, um, like when I sold in my antique mall, uh, I was known as the jewelry, <laughs> the jewelry bag lady because I sold jewelry bags. And that's, I mean, I didn't only sell jewelry bags, but that was one of the things that I became known for very quickly because nobody else in the antique mall was selling them. So I became known as the jewelry bag lady and I didn't put that on a sign, but I put get your jewelry bags here or jewelry bags on sale now. You know, I, I kind of changed it up depending on, you know, <laughs> what I felt like, what kind of mood I was in. But just things like that, because people will start to know you for the type of items or inventory that you carry. You know, you can also let people know that you're a vintage and antique jewelry specialist or vintage jewelry expert or whatever. All right. So you can have fun with this too. Now you also want to consider running promotions. Again, I talked about this. Um, my antique mall really encouraged people to have promotions or to run sales, offer discounts, specials, whatever, because people will come in and they ask, like at my antique mall, people would come in, they'd go to the front and they'd say, what, what booths are running sales right now? And they would obviously have a list of those up front and they would say uh, booth number 25, booth number 63, booth number 99 are all running specials. And so people would make sure to stop at those booths because they wanted to see what the specials were, what the, what the sales were. Right. So people do come in and they specifically look for sales or promotions. OK, so uh, consider doing that at least once a month. Uh, that's probably I think that's what I did. I had something going every month and so I would change it every month. And uh, yeah, because that that's what was easiest for me. But some people change them up every week or some people change them up. Uh, you know, they run a sale every season or every holiday, you know, whatever, whatever will work for you. Now, the other way to market your presence is to network with other vendors. Yeah, <laughs> this actually does work. So let's say you're the jewelry girl in your antique mall and maybe there is a vintage clothing seller in the antique mall as well. Well, you guys could cross promote each other, you know, uh, the clothing seller could say, hey, if you would like to find some beautiful accessories to go with this dress or with some of the uh, clothing items you bought today, make sure you check out my friend in booth number 75. And then you're in booth number 75 and you say, hey, if you'd like to find a gorgeous outfit to wear with this beautiful necklace, check out my clothing, vintage clothing friend in booth number 27 <laughs> or whatever. I have seen people do that and surprisingly it does work. People like the fact that vendors are nice and they are working together and it's not, you know, a hostile environment because I've heard stories about that kind of stuff happening too. But like I said, you can really network with the other vendors and you guys can have a lot of fun or maybe you can run a sale or a promotion together. You know, if you buy something uh, from both of our booths, we will give you 25% off or something like that. All right. So again, it's another opportunity for you to network, to collaborate and to connect and make more sales. 
All right, number seven. And this is all about engaging with customers. Now, some antique malls have rules that you have to work so many hours a month, maybe so many hours per week. And when I say work, in other words, they want you to be in your booth available for customers. So when they come in, you can answer questions, provide a really nice selling experience, um, whatever. You know, my antique mall, I think they had a requirement of, um, I think it was two or four hours per month. And so if you're coming in regularly to restock your booth or your space, that's usually not a problem because you're going to be there that amount of time anyway, restocking, rearranging, fixing things, maybe cleaning up or whatever. So don't worry about that because you're probably going to be in, in the antique mall anyway, just doing the stuff that needs to be done as it relates to managing and maintaining a space. Okay. But you do want to engage with customers because you want to provide excellent customer service and an excellent buyer experience, of course. And you want to be knowledgeable and ready to answer questions about your jewelry's history, maybe how to take care of it, uh, maybe the value or whatever, right? So if you're not staffing the booth yourself, make sure that the people who do staff your booth, if you do have employees or something like that, make sure that they are well-trained and knowledgeable as well, okay? And um, like I said, sometimes you can put little information cards next to some of your pieces, so that way buyers get a little bit of information as it relates to the jewelry or whatever it is that you're selling. Now, you also wanna follow up and encourage customers or buyers, potential buyers who may have been interested in buying something, or maybe they bought a lot of pieces from you and they're just eagerly waiting for you to put some new stuff out so they can come look at it and buy it. So you may want to have, and I've seen other, other vendors do this where they have a little notebook set up in their booth. So that way people can leave their email, phone number or leave a note for you know to you saying hey I'm looking for this or um, if you get any more pieces like this please give me a call or send me an email or whatever so they'll leave a customer notebook in their booth saying hey if you're interested or if there's something you're looking for leave me a note leave me your information and I'll make sure I contact you uh, next time I'm in or, or if I get more of these types of pieces, okay? And I think that's a really good idea and it's a very creative idea. Now, depending on the type of space you have, because I had a glass case, I didn't really have the setup to do that. But if you have a booth, uh, that might be something you want to consider. And it's a great way to keep in touch with potential buyers and customers and also a good way to let people know when you have new merchandise in your space. All right, now if you have the time, you may want to educate customers about uh, the jewelry that you're selling. You know, this is kind of like a, uh, I guess I want to say if you have, if you have the knowledge yourself or if this is something that you enjoy doing, of course, you don't have to do this. But again, the more information you can provide to your buyers, the better the experience will be. And then it really makes the buyer more comfortable in spending the money because at least they're going to be informed and they're going to feel confident that they can trust that they're getting exactly what it is they want or exactly what it is that you say it is or whatever. All right. Let's move on to the next point, point number eight, and this is to continuously evaluate and adapt as it relates to what you're selling in the antique mall. You want to keep track of your sales. What is selling well for you and what just seems to sit and sit? Now, everybody will go through this because not everybody is going to sell everything <laughs> right away, um, but you will learn as time goes on what what sells very quickly 
and what people are looking for. And then you'll also learn, you know, oh, maybe I won't sell any more of these bracelets or whatever because they nobody just seems to be interested, okay? And it doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with your items or that your items are bad, but maybe it's just not a particular fit for this particular selling setup, all right? So pay attention and adapt because you want to adjust your stock to fit customer preferences. That's really what you want to make sure you get uh, dialed in as it relates to this. Now you also want to evaluate your booth setup and make adjustments as it relates to your displays, your arrangements. You know, you want to keep it looking fresh. You want to keep it looking like there's a plethora of new stuff <laughs> in there. Now, this could be fun too, but it can also be a little bit of a chore, especially when, you know, you still have a lot of stuff that hasn't quite moved. Uh, sometimes you have to get really creative as it relates to your displays. Even if it's nothing new in there, you want to make sure that you move stuff around just so it looks different. If you have, you know, the same people coming in, say every weekend, um, you want to make sure your booth looks different so they can say, oh, I didn't notice this before or, you know, whatever, because that will happen. Sometimes you just move an item to a different spot and suddenly it will sell <laughs> in the new spot, even though it didn't sell at all in the first spot you had it in. All right. So these are all things that you have to uh, really experiment with and try and see what works and what doesn't. All right, point number nine is promotion and deals. I talked about that earlier. Uh, I come from the belief that you should have something running constantly, at least once a month. Maybe it's something you run uh, every month and then you change it out every 30 days, whatever the case may be, but you always wanna have something running. And it doesn't have to be anything major. It could be this month, 10% off all necklaces. Uh, the next month, maybe 10% off all earrings, you know, something like that. Uh, whatever you feel comfortable with and something that's not going to be too difficult for you to manage, um, I believe that you should be running some type of sale, promotion, or deal continuously because it really makes, it really makes your booth stand out, okay? Um, you also want to consider doing that seasonally. I talked about that as well. Uh, align your promotions or your sales with holidays or local events, especially, you know, if you expect uh, higher foot traffic. Maybe there's something going on, and so you really want to make sure you capitalize on, you know, the potential that more people will be seeing your items, and that will increase the possibility of you making more sales. All right, point number 10 is networking. I talked about this earlier too. You really want to get to know the other vendors. Um, you want to you know, <laughs> be on good terms with, ev with everyone. You don't want to, you don't want to, you know, get into any, anything negative as it relates to other vendors. Cause unfortunately I've seen that happen too, where there's vendors that just don't like each other and, and it can just be a really awkward uh, situation. Luckily I haven't had that. And I really make a point and go out of my way to make sure <laughs> I don't have that because I don't want to have a bad experience you know, while I'm in the antique mall, I'm just there trying to make money like everybody else. All right. So I try to be really respectful, um, encourage other vendors, uh, see if there's ways we can partner up or collab. Like I talked about earlier, you know, whatever. And I have no problem, um, referring people to other vendors. If I know they're looking for something that I know another vendor carries, or they may have in stock right now. You know, maybe someone's not looking for jewelry, but they're looking for vintage Pyrex. Well, I have no problem telling you the booths that carry that stuff, you know, and um, I just hope someone does the same for me. You know, if they, they come across a buyer looking for jewelry, I, <laughs> I hope that they uh, recommend my space. You know, and uh, this doesn't have to be something that you openly agree on, but uh, I think it's just really good, um, you know, a good practice to, to keep people in the antique mall, even if it's not at your particular booth. Okay. All right. Now, one of the big things, uh, I do have a point written about this. This is point number 11, and this is security. Um, 
I'm going to be honest. This is something that a lot of people worry about and with good reason, because yes, it does happen. People do steal items from antique malls. People do steal, um, not just jewelry, but everything, you know, especially items that are small and, uh, or items that have high value and, I don't want to discourage you and, uh, but this is something that does happen. Now the antique mall that I am at, they have security cameras everywhere, but still it could happen. And again, this is one of the reasons why I chose to rent a glass case because nothing gets stolen out of those because they're locked. And the only way someone can get something out of it is if they have a, antique mall employee come open the booth. They can look at the pieces they want and then, or I should say the case, and then they, they lock it up when the person is done looking at whatever they're looking at right now. Now this, it has its, its pluses and minuses because a lot of people, if something is in a glass case and maybe they're interested in it, but if the antique mall staff is busy, some people don't want to wait for someone to come unlock the case. Or some people will say, well, I don't want to bother the employees, so I'm not going to have them come open the case for me, right? But um, for me, that is what worked because I was selling jewelry. I did not want to have to worry about pieces just mysteriously vanishing, right? And some of the pieces are not cheap. And so I did not want to have to worry about pieces getting stolen. So for me, a glass case worked and I still made sales. I still... You know, people still asked about the things that I had in the case. So um, if you are selling jewelry, I would definitely recommend renting a glass case instead of a full on booth. But some people will rent a full booth because they'll sell jewelry in addition to other things. And you can have little locked cases within your booth as well. I've seen people do that where they have uh, a glass case within their booth space and that's where they keep their jewelry items so they don't just, <laughs> you know, walk off. Again, every antique mall is different. Um, I would definitely ask the antique mall managers or employees, you know, what do they have in place to prevent theft, damage, or loss of the items. Uh, you can also buy insurance for your antique mall space. Now, sometimes the insurance is sold through the antique mall, or it could be something where you have to find um, an, an independent uh, insurance company or something like that. So you can insure your items, especially if they're high value, you know. I, I, I mean, yeah, I would, <laughs> if you're, if you have pieces that you're selling for hundreds or thousands of dollars, uh, I think insurance would definitely be a good idea. Okay, let's move on to point number 12. And this is something that I did and I had a lot of fun with it. I had a lot of success with it. And that was promoting my antique mall space on social media. Now on uh, YouTube, I did a whole series about um, selling my jewelry in an antique mall. And I, I showed the antique mall, I showed uh, the case that I had my jewelry in and I showed the setup of how I had everything arranged in there and it was a lot of fun. And because of those videos, I actually had people messaging me and asking where the antique mall was, what my space number was because they wanted to come shop my case. And so using social media is a great way to attract buyers to your items, not only locally, but also people who may be visiting the area, right? Because I live in Las Vegas. And so a lot of people visit Las Vegas throughout the year for whatever reason. And because my antique mall is actually located on the south end of the strip, you'd be surprised. I, I, I was actually surprised uh, how many people asked me where my antique ball was and they wanted to come shop, which I thought was amazing and wonderful. So use social media, especially locally, you know, if you have a Facebook page for your business or something like that, to promote your antique mall setup. 
All right, use social media platforms to showcase the items in your booth. This can draw buyers in to visit the mall specifically to see your collection like they did with me. And this also gives you an opportunity to engage with customers on social media by posting about brand new items, uh, maybe sharing some stories about the jewelry, and maybe announcing when you will be at the antique mall. So if someone wants to meet you or if someone wants to ask you questions in person. Now, of course, you're going to have to do whatever you are comfortable with. I'm not saying you have to do this, but it's a fun and free way to get people to your items or to your booth or to buy whatever it is you're selling. Okay, so just think about it, have fun with it, do what you're comfortable with. And, um, you know, it's, it's just a really great way to show up for yourself and for your business. But again, do what you're comfortable with and don't stress if that's not something, <laughs> if that's not something you want to do. But it's just an idea that I wanted to throw out there. All right, so my last point about selling jewelry in antique malls is updating your stock frequently. All right, you really want to refresh your inventory as often as you can. Now, ideally, you want to do this once a week, but sometimes that's not always possible. But what I have learned and what has given me the best experience and the most sales was refreshing my inventory as frequently as I could. Now, sometimes I was able to do that two or three times a week because when I was selling those jewelry bags, they would sell almost immediately as soon as I put them in. And so I would have to come back the next day or so to, to refresh or to restock. Um, but I would say for the most part, once a week is ideal. Even if you don't have anything new per se to add to your inventory, like I said, just refreshing and rearranging will do so much to keep your displays fresh, interesting, um, attractive, engaging. Okay. And not only that, but sometimes you won't notice something until you come back <laughs> a second or third time. You know, like sometimes uh, you'll notice that, um, oh, you know, people really like this or some stuff gets moved around. So that kind of tells you, okay, people are looking at this, but maybe for whatever reason, they're not buying it. Maybe the price needs to be reworked or maybe we have to uh, explain how you can use this or how you can wear this or, or things like that. There's just little nuances that you, the more often that you pay attention to your booth, you will pick up on these things. All right. And sometimes too, um, other vendors, you know, the more they see you, they will, they will chime in and let you know, oh, you know, somebody asked me about your booth or somebody, I saw people, you know, looking at this and, and they had some questions or, you know, whatever. So, uh, this is another reason too, why you want to make sure your antique mall is not too far from your house because you want to be there often, right? It's not just something where you set it up and then you come in once a month. No, not at all. You want to be there like I said, bare minimum at least once a week. And so that's another thing you have to take into account when you do sell in an antique mall. How much time do you have to dedicate to working the antique mall part of your business? Because it's not a set it and forget it. It is something that is very hands-on. And so it's not just about, it's not just about working the space, but it's also prepping the items. You know, you have to uh, tag the items. You may have to bundle certain items. You may need to package certain items. So the prep also takes a long time too. At least that's what I found, which I didn't really take into consideration when I did the antique mall thing, because I didn't realize how much time it was taking me to tag each individual jewelry piece. And, um, then if I ran a sale, you know, sometimes you would have to do the markdown price on the individual tags as well. Now, luckily I didn't have to do that because if I just had a 30% off sale, um, I just told the front 
that, hey, I'm running a 30% off sale on these items. And then the front would, you know, make sure that the the buyer got 30% off whatever it was, or maybe it was everything, you know, just depending on what kind of sale or promotion I was running. Okay, so uh, this is a lot. (laughs) We covered a lot in this episode, but I hope it helps you if you are considering selling your jewelry in an antique mall. Um, I did love it. And right now I'm actually not selling my jewelry in an antique mall. I actually just moved out last month because uh, summer is kind of a slow time as it relates to sales there. And I really want to focus more on doing my live selling right now. And um, one of the challenges I had was just being able to keep up with the inventory demand for the antique mall. Because remember, I do live jewelry jewelry sales every week. And so I go through a lot of inventory that way. And so it was really hard to maintain the inventory levels for live selling and my antique mall. So right now I am not selling in an antique mall, but I literally just uh, moved out last month. So all of this information is still fresh in my mind. And you know what? I may go back to selling in an antique mall at some point. Uh, maybe in the fall because that's a really good time. At least from my experience, it was a really good time to have jewelry items in an antique mall. And there's also a lot of fall events here uh, in Las Vegas that brings a lot of foot traffic in. So who knows? Who knows what I'll do? But uh, I will. I will sell in an antique mall again just because I like it so much. But I probably will have to really figure out a new inventory strategy (laughs) just so I can keep up uh, the amount of inventory that I need to keep the antique mall stocked at least to the levels that I think it it needs to be all right so let me know if you have ever sold jewelry in an antique mall, or is it something that you are considering right now? I think it's fun, but like I said, there are some things to keep in mind because there are some challenges as it relates to selling your jewelry this way as well. So leave me a comment, let me know your experience. I would love to read your feedback. And if you have any questions, please drop those in the comments below as well. And I will do my best to help you and to um, support you in any way I can. All right. I want to thank you so much for listening to this episode and spending this time with me. I'll check in with you again really soon.